I've been thinking about starting videos with like a largely admin based preamble. It's dark, I'm wearing glasses, and the first five seconds of the video has failed to contain a hook or a joke. Uh, but don't worry, everything is under control. This video is basically uh, all my annoyances with the quality of YouTube criticism funneled through a satirical analysis of the movie Wing Commander. And I just want to clarify that up top because I am familiar with the average comprehension level of the YouTube commenters. So that's the video. Don't go into this expecting me to mean any of the things that I say. I don't mean any of the things that I say, and I'll make that clear at the end. Uh, though I won't need to spend that much time on that if I use this take now, because uh, obviously you'll, you'll know already. So, um, so that's good. Hopefully that removes any narrative tension and uh, relieves you of the responsibility of enjoyment. I'm going to remove my glasses now and that's how you'll know that the video started. 1999 was a year so packed with the greats, which is maybe why audiences overlooked Chris Roberts' smaller, little, subversive, auteurist masterpiece, Wing Commander. Now, you might have heard of Chris Roberts, and if you have, it's probably because he's making a little embezzlement called Star Citizen. But before that, in 1990, he made one of the most expensive video games of that era, called Wing Commander. It didn't need to be that expensive, nothing about it makes it seem 10 times more expensive than its contemporaries, uh, and officially it wasn't, because the one thing that Chris Roberts loves more than wasted development time is cooking the books. But he had bigger dreams, he dreamt of even bigger wastes of money, so when full motion video came around, he was there making videos for video games with Mark Hamill which secured him a place in the prestigious list of the top 75 most important people in the games industry of 1995, according to Next Gen Magazine. But it still wasn't enough, he still wanted more, and eventually he did realize his Hollywood dreams when he was able to start funding movies by abusing a loophole in the German tax system. And in the middle of all this, he made Wing Commander into a movie, faithfully adapting everything that made Wing Commander so expensive. All movies begin, and Wing Commander is no exception. We arrive at Paragus Station, which is a space station in the middle of space. We see a security officer put down his coffee mug and walk away from his Nokia space computer, which is not what you want to see. Already, this is a surveillance fan's worst nightmare. Then we push in, moving to a Dutch angle as the camera shakes and we hear some bleeping noises, and we know this is not looking good. And then, just when it's telegraphed so much that you almost don't expect it, aliens attack. Now, a lesser director would be afraid of using an opening like this, just because it's overdone and hack, but Chris Roberts sticks to his guns. He's so subversive, he's so cutting edge, that to the untrained eye, it might seem lazy. But what he's doing is telling the audience, strap in for an hour and a half of cliches being delivered at face value. Now, we're told that the Kilrathi are after the Navcom, we're left to assume that that is the aliens are after the navigational computer that sends out all of the teleportation coordinates for Earth's ships. But why are we told this rather than seeing it? Because this movie is like Jaws. Chris Roberts is hiding the bad guys from us so that when we do see them, it's a revelation. And his faith in the audience is so high that we don't even need to see it happen. We're just left to assume that they were successful and we follow an emergency transmission back to Admiral Tolwyn, who will explain exactly what this means. Now, the bad guys are here, and with the Navcom they can fly over here and teleport to Earth in 23 hours. The Earth fleet is there, no places to teleport, uh, that's going to take them 25 hours. So that's two hours of Earth being destroyed. So the Admiral hatches a little plan. There's a ship that's out there, so he's going to send a message to this ship, they're going to hand deliver it over to here, fly down here, intercept the bad guys, find out all they can, and fly back before it's too late. Now, admittedly, this is not a very good plan, because they have no way of even getting out there in time, which makes a round trip seem very improbable. So we're 10 minutes in, and it's good to have characters. So we meet Blair, who's like the protagonist one, Taggett, who's like a French space pirate Obi-Wan, and Maniac, 
who's like a crazy pilot. He's like a w the wacky hotshot that gets people killed. Like all good original sci-fi, there's a version of the Force. So we learn about pilgrims, uh, and Taggart easily identifies that Blair is a pilgrim because of the necklace that he's wearing. And here is really where the mise-en-scene comes into its own. We see Taggart in front of these antique maps, wistfully talking about pilgrims, while he's clearly wearing a matching necklace, which is subtle foreshadowing to the fact that Taggart is also a pilgrim. A fact that will remain unrevealed for the next hour. During this, Maniac, in his wacky hotshot way, has been flying them directly into a gravity well. And it's up to the protagonist, using his space magic that he just found out about, to do an equation so good that it'll allow them to escape. Joseph Campbell's overrated monomyth has the hero learning and growing throughout the story, but Chris Roberts doesn't bother with such gimmicks. Our hero immediately accepts the call to action, and now, in a twist on the traditional hero's journey, he's already a master at space maths and will not improve for the rest of the movie. Because why have character development when your character can be perfect in the first place? So he easily does the calculations, not only allowing them to escape, but instantaneously transporting them to their destination, while Maniac does roller coaster hands. It's lucky for the Admiral that exactly this course of events happened, because in any other scenario, they just don't get out there in time and his plan is already fucked. So we arrive at the Tiger's Claw, and we get to hear the Admiral's encoded message, which is completely different to what he told us before, actually. Before he was saying, you know, go out there and gather intelligence, but now he's saying, uh, could you just delay the bad guys a bit to make up the time difference? Which is actually a much better plan, but it raises the question, which is it? You know, what is the plot of this movie? A question that Chris Roberts masterfully leaves hanging for the rest of the runtime. This section of the movie is a lot like Starship Troopers if it wasn't so bogged down by satire. Maniac and Blair are here to become fighter pilots. That was what they were on their way to do anyway. This whole Admiral's plan thing was just a random coincidence. Maniac's opening gambit is to go flirt with a background extra while Blair goes and sits in a dead person's jet. Then they meet their crewmates, and unfortunately Blair won't shut up about the dead guy, uh, and unfortunately it turns out that everyone else is in denial. Then they see his necklace, and unfortunately it turns out that everyone is racist towards pilgrims, especially Australians and Germans. They're the most racist. And a fight almost breaks out, but the titular wing commander, Lieutenant Dev Rowe, bursts in and breaks it up. You ladies don't stand down, you'll have a problem with me. And what she's done there is qu quite a clever trick, actually. She uses it a couple times. All right, ladies. All right, ladies. All right, ladies, listen up. Again, Chris Roberts is masterfully deploying cliches because what's happening there is she's addressing a room of primarily men and saying that the boys are girls, right? And it's worse to be a girl than it is to be a boy. So just in one word, she's able to accept that premise and lower all of the boys to girl status. And imagine being a girl, ugh. But we shouldn't judge it too harshly. I mean, this was 1999 back before anyone knew better. Now, Taggart makes a little risky unplanned jump of his own, instantaneously transporting them to their destination. Uh, which is just great. I guess the Admiral does know what he's doing because he's got a lot of lucky coincidences on his side. There's a couple common oversights of the sci-fi genre in terms of realistic physics. Wing Command is one of the few sci-fi movies to have realistic gravity in space. All of the spaceships move almost exactly as if they were affected by Earth's gravity. And in terms of sound traveling through a vacuum, there's a couple of sections of space stealth where they stay as quiet as possible so that the other ships can't hear them. And that's gonna happen exactly three times, much like the risky unplanned jumping. You know, the rule of three is a great way of structuring setup and payoff, but even better than that is to just have moments exactly repeat themselves three times, uh, which makes for a very stress-free viewing experience, aside from the occasional worry that you might have skipped back 20 minutes. Space stealth number one ends with Blair getting seen by some bad guys. He shoots them down, but he's inadvertently revealed their location. So they head back to the ship, where the German co-pilot has concerns that this was a deliberate sabotage attempt by Blair, and the racial tension comes to a head. But fortunately, Blair is able to clarify that he's only Pilgrim on his mother's side. 
so it all turns out okay. I'm not a pilgrim! My mother was. During this, Maniac has been getting along swimmingly with Lieutenant Rosie. I take balls, big balls, not ovaries to maintain four enemy fighters. <laughs> That's bad, Jack. In the 11 hours that they've known each other, they appear to have not stopped talking an exclusively fighter jet based sexual euphemism. And now, fully clothed and under a bed sheet, in what seems like a logistical nightmare, we're to assume that they are mid-sex. And in addition to that, she's a tough, attractive, black woman, so that checks all the boxes on the 90s movie side character imminent death checklist. But to be fair, this is 1999, back before they knew sex was allowed and bigotry was bad. And to his credit, Chris Roberts has them formalize her imminent death by declaring their undying, eternal love for each other. As they continue to fuck around in space, Taggart decides that it's time for the midpoint action sequence. Uh, and to convince everyone to do it, he reveals that he's actually a high-ranking intelligence officer. It's one of the few truly surprising twists of all time, because there's no setup for it, and there's no payoff. So it's just pure twist. Then they fight and win for 20 minutes, and everyone heads back. But Maniac is so crazy he decides instead of going back what he'll do is just a little bit of accidental vehicular manslaughter so he kills rosie she crash lands onto the deck where she presumably dies but we don't get to see it because in a very heartfelt moment devro immediately insists that they bulldoze her off the deck now what was that fight about who knows what's happening now who knows, but they've got to be quiet so that the alien ships can't hear them. And I guess because plot needs to happen without our protagonist having any internal struggle, the ship just starts falling apart. Blair's almost sucked out, but isn't, and the captain hits his head and is replaced by the German co-pilot. And you might think, right, foreshadowing, Chekhov's gun, the racial tension through line is going to come to a head. But no, Chris Roberts is too clever for that, that would be too obvious. Instead, that entire subplot is just completely abandoned. Now you might have noticed that that little section did not develop the plot at all, which is great. Obviously we love a slow burn that takes its time to deliver some character moments, but plot still needs to happen and Chris Roberts is continuing his self-imposed challenge of developing it without any internal struggle. So in another one of his trademark clever subversions of the genre, they just run out of fuel uh, and I guess they decide that the best way to get some more is to go and board a random alien ship and steal some. So the entire cast becomes troops and finally we see the bad guys and we're treated to minutes of uninterrupted screen time so that we can study every detail of these rubbery cat suits. And as it turns out, even though they just picked a random ship so that they could steal its fuel, this ship is the one containing the stolen navcom, which is a hell of a coincidence. So they steal that back, and this changes everything. The Admiral's plan is essentially rendered moot at this point, though in terms of saving Earth it's going great, because as far as we know, without that navcom, the aliens will never be able to even reach Earth. But this is just another one of Chris Roberts' challenges to the audience. I guess the aliens took notes or something because they're definitely still headed back to Earth somehow, and the good guys have to stop them still, somehow. So to inspire Blair to save the world, Taggart reveals that he's a pilgrim. He gives Blair a second necklace and sends him off to Earth. I guess in the original cut, uh, Blair lost his necklace, and so this was him getting a replacement one. But cleverly, by cutting that out, they've managed to make the movie shorter. For some reason, only Blair and Devro can head back to Earth. So they get in their fighters, Devro gets shot, Blair makes risky jump number three, he arrives back at Earth, transmits the aliens the location, the Earth fleet arrives and they win. And Chris Roberts himself welcomes us back to Earth space. Welcome to Sol Sector, Lieutenant. Now it turns out, in a big shock twist, that this self-insert of a protagonist's first name is Christopher, and in a bigger, even more shocking twist, without any setup, unless you include their raw natural chemistry, Dev Rowe was the love interest. There's 156,980 frames in this movie, and every single one is packed with visuals. It's not often that you see a movie without purpose or plot, and I think Chris Roberts' dogged devotion to never doing anything new 
is truly original, uh, and that is what makes Wing Commander one of the greats. Not really though, obviously. <laughs>